Welcome back to the Field Sales Leadership Guide podcast. This week, Ben has a fantastic conversation with our guest, Todd Capone, sales leader and author of the award-winning bestseller, The Transparency Sale. His latest book, The Transparent Sales Leader, takes a deeper dive into how transparency and decision science affects your sales team's performance. Let's dive right in to our conversation with Todd Capone. We have with us on this podcast, uh, Todd Capone. Todd is an accomplished sales leader. One of the more impressive ones was the exact target exit that you led $3 billion to into Salesforce and then parlayed that into a chief revenue officer role over at, uh, at Power Review. Todd's going to answer some of the questions that I will consistently get around this. And this is what growth equity and private equity will assume or ask. When a phenomenal sales leader is either at an organization or they're looking to hire him or her. So even though private equity thinks it's some secret sauce that they're never going to figure out, you have figured it out and your whole goal is to help other sales leaders uncover it. So I'm incredibly excited to have you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And and I don't want to take too much credit for exact target. I was on the leadership team, but that bus was going with or without me. So I, but I appreciate that. And to your point, you know, I've written two books and the first book was about this idea that the behavioral science community knows how we as human beings make decisions. So little of that had made it into the world of revenue generation, such an opportunity to do, do that, do it the right way, do it through authenticity and transparency and being a good human being and a service professional. And then on the leadership side, one of the things that I had created early in my kind of revenue leadership career was it used to drive me nuts that having been a salesperson and always having a framework or a structure or process, I get promoted to run a sales organization, the greatest thing ever, woohoo. But then within two days, I felt like I was a dog chasing a car down the street, that I never had a structure or framework. My nerdy brain doesn't work that way. So I created a framework for myself that I could just use to plan, strategize, communicate, create consistency. And when the heat went up in the kitchen, I always had that to fall back on and for everybody and everything that I talk about, it's meant to be like head slapping. Like, of course I should be thinking this way, but the frameworks, if you get a good framework, that's easy to digest and start to use, you sound smarter than 98% of the world. When I could walk into a private equity discussion and go, Hey, look, here's the way that I think about maximizing the revenue capacity of revenue facing or customer facing teams. It's five pieces. Here they are. And here's the way that I use them. They're like, who is this guy? And it doesn't mean I'm any better, but I have a method, like approach that I use and I repeat that creates that impression. If you can just spend some time and adjust your frameworks and get smart about them, you're going to put yourself out ahead of 98% of the rest of the revenue leadership world, because you're going to have a structure and who else does? So a lot of it starts there. Right. That's a great segue. So that second book, The Transparent Sales Leader, that book talks about how leaders can plan, how they can effectively plan, plan, strategize, and really communicate, but by way of transparency to reach what's the pinnacle of every sales leader, right? And that's growth and sustainable success. So you just talked about the framework, frame, uh, framework, I should say, about how you built that out and whether it's five, the exact five that you just mentioned, but Talk to me a little bit about where you started. So like all sales leaders, and I am as guilty as the next uh, guy or gal, that you started in a more coin-operated system, right? And it was a carrot and stick model, and it was having people chase needless activities. Talk to me about how you started there, and then you would evolved into this transparency concept. Yeah. So let, we'll start with the transparency concept and, and really so that everybody understands that because transparency is an overused word. It gets mixed up with authenticity all the time. Both are important. They're actually very different from one another. When I was the chief revenue officer in my last role at Power, in all guests from the company name, we we're in the reviews. So we helped uh, retailers and brands collect and display ratings and reviews on their website. So even if you don't know what that means, you've interacted with it before. If you've ever bought a pair of Crocs on Crocs.com or Twitter on Vineyard Vines or a thousand other retailers and brands, we were the engine working in the background with the collect and the display of those reviews. So when you look at a product, you scroll down, you see them. That was us. Here's what happened. 
a few years ago, I'm running this revenue organization and our marketing team partnered with Northwestern University here in Chicago just to look at, all right, when a website's acting as a salesperson, what do people do? Well, the data came back with three data points, two of which changed my life like could only happen to a nerd. Like I quit my job and I wrote a book, right? And here's the three. The first one that didn't change my life was that we all read reviews, right? No surprise there, but when we're buying something we haven't bought before that's of medium to high consideration, meaning not like a pack of gum, but something that matters, we all read the reviews. But the two data points that changed my life. Number one, are you all one of those weirdos that skips the five-star reviews and read the fours, threes, twos, and ones first? Do you go to the negative first? Well, turns out that doesn't make you a weirdo. It makes you a human being. We, we all do that. We Skip the fives. We want to read the fours, threes, twos, and one. What could go wrong? We go there first. And then that last data point is on a five-star scale. So, you know, product with five stars. When that average review score on that product is between a four, two, and a four, five, that's actually optimal for purchase conversion. Meaning product that is negative reviews sells at a higher conversion rate than a product that is nothing but perfect five-star reviews. And so I looked at that and thought, well, that's weird. I mean, actually a product that had nothing but perfect five-star reviews sells at the same conversion rate as a product that has an average review score of around a 3.25, which kind of sucks. And so I looked and I was like, all right, that's when a website's acting as a salesperson, interesting, but why is it we're going to the negative first? And why is people actually need the negative to be able to trigger a purchase decision? I started digging into it and I very quickly came to this realization that, wait, that's not just when a website's acting as a salesperson. That's when a human is acting as a salesperson too. That when we actually lead with what we give up to be great at our core or what a client might not like about our circumstance. And, you know, you look at a lot of the most successful, even retailers in the world, they do this really well. They play their cards face up and go, hey, we don't do this stuff, but we give that up so we can be great at this. So, we started trying it, meaning we would go into these B2B type selling environments and we would lead first conversation with, hey, before we get too deep into it, companies like yours, you're typically looking for this stuff. We don't do this part very well. And if that's going to be important, can we talk about that now before we waste a bunch of time with each other? Builds trust, creates that connection, it disarms their resistance to that influence, that gross sales influence. They make decisions faster. Our win rates go up because you qualify in faster and better, but also because you qualify out the deals you're probably going to lose anyway. And then the most fun part is you differentiate in the way that you sell and partially in so doing, you disarm your competitors from being able to message against because you, you already did. So the end result there on that transparency piece is that transparency it actually sells better than pretending to be perfect, retains better, grows better, leads better. Then I also believe that, gosh, the proliferation of reviews on everything we do buy and experience means you got to do it anyway. So now is the time to figure it out. That's where a lot of it started was that transparency piece. We inherently know that being honest and being a good person is good, but turns out it sells better too. And a lot of my almost subconscious approach to sales and sales leadership was always through that lens. Now I know why. It makes a ton of sense. And again, something that we've always been so guilty of, and I think this is more younger reps that come in to an organization. You and I talked about when we connected a while back around following the standard metrics of four to six times, you're just going to take your win rate at a certain stage divided by that number. And if something goes wrong, you don't know why it goes wrong. But talk to me a little bit about how you made that shift. If we're coaching, because a lot of sales managers, especially the young ones, are going to say, well, you got to run it by the math because that's how great sales teams are run. But there's such a thing as bad math. And so if you're coming in and you're essentially just hanging the wrong numbers on an organization or on yourself, that's going to amplify really bad behavior. So You've done it. I've done it. Talk to me a little bit about a better way to do it. The, by the way, just the initial trigger on that is I remember you, that data point that says that like, hey, for you to get a response and engagement from an executive today, it takes 18 touches. 
All right, cool. And then you see the comments under it. Oh, crap. I've been stopping at four. I need to add 14. And I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, what? Like, maybe we should take a step back and go, well, wait a second. Why is it taking a, why is our messaging so crappy that somebody finally gives in after 18? Like, why can't we take a look and go, well, why does it need to be 18? Why don't we get smarter and make it four? And that same exact thing goes to what you were just talking about with the pipeline. I did this wrong. And you just mentioned it, that I would measure my team, my leaders by that. Hey, at all times, you got to have 4X your quota and pipeline. Otherwise, you're not going to get it, right? And we would look at pipeline load and then we'd go rep to rep and go, hey, why don't you have 4X? And the reps would go, sorry. And then they would go fill their pipeline with 4X filled with crap. We've got to stop that siloed thinking that says, hey, it's got to be 4X and think about it more in terms of ratio. And so the way that I thought about it, I had seen this thing called the results formula long ago. I kind of made it my own. But what the, the process, when we think about the math, is instead of getting in those silos that says, hey, we need a certain number of qualified opportunities at all times, is instead of that, we should go, all right, how many qualified opportunities do we have? How big are they? How often are we winning them? And how fast? Those are the four metrics. In unison, that's where you can start to drive your results. So for example, we started to get really smart about deal qualification and what we were going after. We started that transparency piece. So we were losing the crappy deals right away. And we were celebrating the reps who did that. And I remember going into a board meeting and the board's looking at my metrics. We are killing it. But then I remember the, the chairman looking at it going, Todd, it looks like you probably have a problem with market because the number of qualified opportunities in your pipeline, it looks like it's down. And I'm like, problem with them? I love it. Because what they've done, is they've gotten a lot smarter and I want that number to come down. Because every one of those qualified opportunities is, is a cost. Every crappy deal that we're spending a minute of our time on. So we got to get tighter on that and look at the ratios and go, hey, a lower number of qualified opportunities, that's cool when your deal sizes are higher, your win rates are higher, and your cycle lengths have gotten more efficient. That's why we're killing it. It's because we're not spending our time on crap. We lose us, like most of them. They're very small and they're taking forever for us to leave. So that's the way that I always thought about it. It started with that trigger of the 18 thing. Like that's the duck. If any of you that are listening are going, hey, we're stopping at 10. We got to add eight. Cop like, stop it. Stop it. Look at your messaging and get better about it. And then that 4X of your quota, gosh, if my quota or if my pipeline load could be 4X, but we're closing that many deals that big, that fast, that means I'm getting the 200% of my number because I'm hoping to get to that two to one ratio. So that's the way that when you hear a stat, sit back and go, all right, why is it that way first? Before you just go, well, if that's what everybody's doing, I long to be average. Stop it. And so great, some great insights. So, and look, I've, per, I've personally dealt with this. I remember with the business development team, these are the guys that are grounded and pounded making phone calls. I followed the numbers, 100 phone calls, we had a conversion rate, and they were all positive numbers. I asked the team, you know, we got the tools out there. Everybody knows that these inside tools are. And I told the team to increase their productivity, not 100%, but 200%. And they bemoaned it because they wanted to do the research. That's what was making them successful. I just saw a raw activity number and said, look, we increase the activity. Yeah, there's going to be a little bit of loss. There'll be some, you know, diseconomies of scale, but it'll be more than made up for because they're going from 100 calls a day to 250. Those guys made 400 calls a day and set no discovery calls whatsoever. And they did it for a week. Now, I believe for the most part, they were putting their effort in, but it is, if you are a metrics, there is going the wrong direction and chasing a number for the sake of a number. If there isn't, to your point, reason behind it. If there isn't some thought behind it, then that's a big opportunity for you to look internally and see where you could get better. So what, aside from transparency and making sure that you're asking the right question, talk about why, if it's, if we can do it in four and as opposed to 18, we could do some internal work. If I'm a sales leader and I'm doing 18 and I'm looking at this and going, oh, let me lower the volume here so that my boss doesn't hear that we're what are some of the things, if you could give, because look, we're both big fans, 
don't stay at 40,000 feet. Give me some specifics. Like what are the handful of things that I could do as a sales leader in your playbook to go from 18 to, and we'll just stick with the number four. How do I get there? Yeah, there's a bunch there. I think number one is you've got to do the research and understand where you are best suited to help as many customers as possible. And how do you do that? Well, number one, clearly look at your win and understand, like get more granular around the firmographic, meaning the company types, the verticals, the industries that they're in, their prerequisite, what their environment looked like, the demographic, meaning the levels of these individuals, the titles, where do we win? Where do we lose best there? But the second piece of that, I just said it was, you get to get really good at analyzing your losses. And a couple of things here. Number one is when you look at those losses, I've been in environments where when a deal was lost, the, the rep was chided for getting outsold. And one of my companies, when I got to my last company, I walked in, sat down, I looked at our CRM and we had deals in there. There was a woman that was in that same table as me. It was kind of a startup as we were getting rolling. She had clearly lost the deal. We talked about it. And then I looked in the CRM and the deal was gone. It didn't go to close loss. It went out two years. It's closed day. And I was like, hey, Jennifer, that, didn't we lose that deal? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're going to read and focus on it in a couple of years. So I just moved the, the close date up. I was like, all right, what's going on here? Can you move that to close loss? And she's like, yeah. She moved it to close loss. All of a sudden, all the executive team gets a notification of that loss deal. And sure enough, my CEO comes walking out. Jennifer, what happened? Right? And basically getting on her. And so... That drove me nuts that it was kind of like this, hey, you got outsold, better luck next time. That's lost. We just lost all that time. Why can't we get an ROI for it? And so one of the things that I did, and I'm a nerd and kind of a jackass sometimes, and this caused some problems with my CEO. He and I didn't get along at the beginning because I wanted to take us from punish the loser to celebrate the loser. And what that meant was I had another rep named Dave. He was working on a big deal. He lost it. I called him up and I was like, hey, Dave, come into the office on Friday. I've got a surprise for you. And it's a good one. Like you're not getting fired or anything. Like that. And he's like, all right. He comes in. We got champagne for everybody. And we celebrated him. Because I wanted to make the point that, hey, a new culture around celebrating losses for the effort, you're already getting hit in the pocket. But the most important thing you can do is let's celebrate it for the lessons that can be learned. Because what I realized really quickly, and if you're punishing losers or just giving people a slap on the back and go better luck next time, is that we're losing for the same reasons over and over again, and we don't know it, right? We're making the same mistakes over. There's losers sitting in your pipeline right now, and you have no idea because you have not celebrated that loss and learned from it. And we started to document, and we would celebrate the rep even louder when they were willing to say, gosh, I wish I would have seen this earlier, or I messaged this the wrong way, or this industry, we're seeing this trend, those more lessons that we could pull out of it and then apply it not only to the current pipeline, but the way that we thought about prospecting and who we went after, man, those lessons were gold. We made those mistakes, you know, making a mistake, cool, let's lose fast. And number, you know, if we're losing for the same reasons over and over again, and we don't know it, that's stupid. And so learning those lessons and applying it helped us not only manage our pipeline and get out of those deals we we're going to lose anyway faster, but it helped our prospecting. We honed our focus. And again, lower number of qualified opportunities, but the win rates went up, the deal sizes went up, and we were winning them a lot faster. So on the heels of that, I got a follow-up question for you. In my world, there are three types of CEOs. There's the finance CEO, there's a technology CEO, and then there's a sales CEO. Is a sales CEO from the 1990s. There you, you grew go. Up old in off the old school, hey, more monkeys and more typewriters, you know, that kind of thing. And, and so, yeah, I had to break them of that. That was part of the reason that we had the friction. And, hey, listen, you hired me to do a job. I got to change the culture. Like, we've got to create a culture where losing is celebrated. It's got to happen quick. And we've got to get so efficient on this pipeline because, again, the most valuable asset everybody in this room has to convert to revenue is their time 
and it's never going to be any earlier than it is right this second. So that, so stay, sticking with the question that I think is going to be on the minds of the folks that are listening in here is, do you have a couple of suggestions for sales leaders, whether even if it is a sales driven CEO, what do you need to do to change that culture? Because you did it, you took a risk, right? But you were hired for a reason. All the stuff you said, but if I'm, you know, if I'm new or even if I'd been there for two to three years and I'm willing to reboot and say, look, I've got it wrong for the past couple of years. If I'm listening to this podcast, how do I, how do I attack that? Yeah. I mean, that was part of the thing that got me hired was the, the framework we talked about earlier. You know, the CEO, when he was interviewing for CRO roles for this company, Apparently, I found this out later that he had interviewed 13 candidates before I came in. And when I came in, I came in with this framework, this revenue capacity framework. And so when he was interviewing me, one of the questions was, hey, Todd, how do you think about your role? Like, how do you structure it? What's your process? And I'm being the nerd I am. I'm like, it turns out I have a framework and this is what we're going to do. I call it the five F's of maximizing revenue capacity. You as a revenue leader, whether it's sales, marketing, client success, you've got all of your roles and responsibilities fall into one of five buckets. And if you can lay them out every day, every week, every quarter, you can use it as your plan. You can communicate this way. And here's the five. The first one is focus, meaning you as a revenue leader have a responsibility to hone the focus of your team. When they wake up in the morning, where are they spending their time? The right opportunity, the right people with the right pre prerequisite. Number two, is then you have to build your field. So the second half is the field organization to support that focus. And that means the right people in the right places with the right experience, the right tools and the right resources. All right. Once you've established that, a field to attend to that focus, your third F, the fundamentals, you've got a responsibility to make sure that those, that field organization gets the right things right consistently. Messaging, positioning, presenting, demoing, proposing, closing, handoffs to deliver it, all that stuff. Number four, no shock here. You got to do a forecast. And that forecast includes the metrics and KPIs that lead to being proactive instead of reactive. And the fifth F sounds cheesy. I would argue it's the most important, but it's the word fun. And when I'm talking about fun, I'm not talking about parties, cotton candy, lollipops. I'm talking about culture that you as a revenue leader need to cultivate a culture where your team is intrinsically inspired, meaning they want to put in discretionary effort. They want to show up every day. They want to stay. They want to do their best. They want to go tell their friends. They want to go review what it's like to work there on the glass doors and the Indeed. When that happens, turnover goes down, performance goes up, your time higher goes up because your reputation goes up. That culture circle, you know, circles all of them. So if you can internalize those five Fs, again, as soon as you get done listening to this, you could literally write them on a whiteboard and create a 30, 60, 90 day plan for yourself that says, where are we now? Where do we need help? What are the actions we can take? What are we going to do? Like, how are we going to prioritize it? You can have a 90 day plan in your back pocket at all time. When I walked in and laid that on them, the guy was just like, oh crap, right, like here we go. That's going to do all this other stuff. It's going to look more at a macro level versus we got to get deals. Let's look at how do we maximize the revenue capacity of the entire organization? And it comes through those five. So if I'm wrapping this up as the takeaway for a sales leader, it's the preparation. The fact that you walked into this interview as one of the late stage candidates, or maybe you were even late in the application process, clearly did enough to get the job and do some great things with it. It's the prep work you had done of years of wins and losses and figuring out the hard way, but if I come in prepared with some flavor and it should be all five flavors of what you're doing, then the team has predictability. The yes. team can start to, because those don't all happen at the same time, right? I mean, culture is by and large, you have to have people that are, there's sort of individuals that there is a trade-off. Sometimes you have to be very invested in their myopic needs. And then there are times where they got to tow the company line. You probably figured out very quickly whether you had the right people there or not. Sales teams, you're going to have some phenomenal culture guys. The organization could be on fire and they'll help you keep the building from burning down. But as you think through all of those steps, the one area that I really want to focus on is centered around process. Talk to us a little bit, because a lot of what we do at Map My Customers is we are trying to help organizations 
with the backbone of process. We are the system of record that allows the reps to, to focus on doing what they love. Look, you still got to get data in the system. This is we, I use this metaphor all the time of eating your vegetables. There is still an eating your vegetables component of CRM. But talk to me a little bit about what effective CRM looks like and some of the great organizations you've led. Yeah, I think number one is so many, or one of the Fs I did not mention is fear, right? And that seems to be the F that a lot of leaders want to go with. It's fear, like, like that kind of crap. If you're in a canoe and you're getting chased by a shark, you're going to paddle, but survival mode is not building a business. And we've got to get out of that. So one of the things that I did, and I always do when I, when I was taking over revenue teams of any sort, this is the speech I gave the first time I got promoted. And my CEO at the time, when I got promoted to my first leadership role, I was running sales ops for the company, but he saw my nerdy brain and he saw my desire to lead. He gave me the, like, Todd, I, we think you're ready. Like, cool. But he's like, Todd, you can't be their buddy, anymore, right? You got it. You got to drive. And I'm like, well, then I'm going to suck at this. The first speech that I gave that I don't know if he liked or not, but he's one of my best buddies now, you know, 15 years later. So he must have liked it was listen. We are still peers. Just because I've got a big title does not make me any more important than anybody. We are peers. We just have different responsibilities. You know, your responsibility is to go out there and be our voice to our customers and help customers achieve optimal outcomes, whether it's with us or with somebody else as quickly as possible, like that whole thing. My role is to clear the field for you and to help you hone your focus and to make sure that you're surrounded by the things that are going to make you successful and not put their barriers around it. But I'm also the voice piece to the rest of the organization. I've got to be able to see what's coming so that I can make sure that those resources are ready for you and that we're optimizing your journey. And unless you're willing to help me, right, it becomes really hard for me to help you, yeah. right? I would love, we're all going to love it here and we're going to be able to have an optimized structure where you're all going to need a bigger wallet. And so I think part of it starts with just making sure that you're creating that environment where your reps have empathy for what it takes for you to be able to make them better at what their job is. And that, that's one of the mistakes I see all the time is that we look at the CRM as the hammer and the stick. And instead, it can be when it's done right, the means by which a whole organization can help. Because again, the biggest reason that companies fail is not because the products suck, their leaders suck, the economy sucks. It's because they're not selling enough, they're right? And again, you know, Dales is the engine here and all of you out in the field, you're the reason that happens, but we can't help you. Everything falls apart. And so number one is organizations and environments where reps understand that they've got that empathy and they want to help you help them. That that's a, that's a great place to start. Why do you think CRMs are so hard to get off the ground. I mean, I have, I have my own thoughts on it. We covered that in a, in a prior podcast, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on why is it so hard to get to that point of help me help you? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. Like when I went out on my own, you know, being a leader forever and trying to drive that behavior. And then I go out on my own, I bought a CRM and I stopped using it within about four weeks. It's crazy, right? Like, do it. But so much of it is you've got to make sure that you created it in a way that it actually is providing the information that's going to be helpful to the rest of the organization. I bought a crappy one. It was clunky and it was hard to use and it was creating friction in my day and I wasn't getting the value out of it. I couldn't see the value out of it. We've got to create it in a way that's, hey, listen, what are the core things that we as a leadership team are going to be able to take and be able to learn from? And yeah, we've got investors that we need to satisfy and give them a forecast that we can be comfortable with. But we also need to be able to take that data to know where to invest and to know where the friction is and to know where we're wasting our time and where our time is most valuable. And just making sure that your CRM is created in a way where your reps, those people that are going to be inputting the information are able to see clearly why they're doing it and see the fruits of that labor. I've been in organizations where our opportunity screens are like, scroll, 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 there's 400 fields. And it's just like, why am I doing this? And I've never once heard 
that that question that I answered in there is helping me in any way. So I, the environment and the culture permeates everything we do. And I believe that that environment, the culture and that CRM setup, keep it simple, keep it focused on the things that are really going to drive the proactive measures and the predictability that your investors and the rest of the organization need and get rid of all the other crap quickly as you possibly can. Keep feeding back to your team the data, show them like, hey, this is the trend we're seeing. And there were times where we would do that. We'd get in a room with the salespeople and they'd be like, that's true. Well, hey, that's what the data is telling us. The investment we are about to make to help you. Like, we didn't know if it's right. So there's some of that, like you've got to feed back to the team so they can see that, hey, we're using this. We're making investments. And if this is wrong, you tell us now and let's go fix it. That's great. So it's purpose for the sales reps, proactive because you've got the data and predictable also because you have the data. If I were to give you $30 million and I say, here you go, right? Or all companies survive because of sales and we want to sell more. I don't care, Todd, how you spend it. Here's 30, go make it 130. If you don't know how, if you don't even know where to begin with that number, then you have a transparency gap. You've got a data gap. You've got a lot of challenges. And so leaders out there should really think about that. If you are just doing what you did last year, which is what you did 10 years ago, there's going to come a time that your competition is going to, whatever's kept you competitive will dissolve. It will decay. And if you don't know why, then it's going to catch up to you. That's why that 5S framework is so important. Because there's no magic answer. And the 5S framework for me, I used it on a daily and weekly basis where I would look and go, hey, is our focus, are we still here? You don't even know it unless you're spending the time every so often. So many startup leaders that I talk to, and I don't do much consulting on that side anymore, but when I would, I would talk to them about, all right, when you wake up in the morning, who are you going to spend your time on? I would argue there's a difference between ICP, ideal customer profile, and focus. ICP is who's ideal, but hey, if they've got something other than lint in their wallet, they're a potential. Stop it, right? Like we've got to determine what is going to be optimal in terms of addressable market, but also how big these deals are going to be, how fast we're going to be able to win them, how often we're going to be able to win them. If we don't know what that is and our ability to address that, we wake up in the morning and we're calling on 10 different industries and 10 different buyer personas. We need to be experts in our customer. Like I'm an advocate for what I call extreme firmographic focus, which is, hey, if we like at Power Reviews, we could call on anybody that collects reviews, but we got really specific on retailers and brands. And then we would go through these sprints on, hey, let's do health and beauty. Let's learn everything we can learn about health and beauty. Let's bring in our customers that are in that space. Let's ask them questions about what's going on in their world. Let's look at the case studies. Let's figure out what they read, where they go to get smarter about their business. Let's become health and beauty expert. We didn't have to shrink territories. My reps would wake up in the morning going, I can't wait to call another health and beauty company. They did it with confidence. They were able to make those leaders of those organizations smarter about their business, not ours. And it led to our solution instead of leading with it. And so that's, that's another piece of this is you, you know, you can't get, turn that 30 million into 130 million, unless you know, your focus, you build a field to support it. You get the fundamentals, right? You're measuring the right stuff and you create a culture so that your people want to show up, stay, do their best and advocate like that. Those are the pieces. That's great. And I'll tell you, because in sales, we're visual creatures. We love the infograph probably more than even marketing that's forced to create it because we love them so much. But give me a one pager, make it look slick and I won't even need to show up. I can just hand it off and with a, with a contract that they can fill out. But one of the things that we see getting to the data element of it and something you described of the show them the data and explain to them why the data is valuable. Getting into our technology specifically, one of the things that we do for field sales teams works out incredibly well in getting the rep to, I speak so often through metaphors, but it's kind of the Miyagi wax the fence or, or paint the fence, right? Wax on, wax off. If you do the effort, here's what happens. And now we've been in business for a long time, so we're able to show this. Let's say all of us are going out and getting the data into the system. And my territory is North Carolina. When I get the data into the system, I can now categorize who are my tier A customers versus my tier later customers. Your description before about who's your ICP, it might be, and my boss might've told me to go after the thousand companies and go knock on doors until my hands bleed. But if I'm out in front of customers and I figure out 
who has something going on within their business, a very short time boxed opportunity that's going to feed revenue to us. And I can prioritize them inside of our engine, our big machine, then we're going to just capture more revenue. So a lot of what we do in showing the rep is, look, go out and get the good data. Data goes into the system. Now you can tier these pinpoints on a map, right? It's quite literally that visual. And then from there, if you've got a thousand pins, but you can only hit nine customers over a two day span, these are the nine you're going to go after because they're tier A, but that's because you put the work in and that'll never go. And that's why I mean, we can talk about AI until we're blue in the face. Sales reps will always survive because at least in our lifetime, they're the ones that are going to extract that little thing that you can you can then make a much bigger thing. And that's the personal interactions. And you need all the things that we just described. But you know, part of the thing that gets us excited is that we plug into the information ecosystem that allows you to make smart decisions. You know, for anybody who's watching and not just listening, behind me is when cool people are doing cool things on the weekends, I'm collecting, reading, learning from late 1800s, early 1900s book and magazines on sales and sales leadership. I'm building kind of a mini museum behind me here. But one of the things that in many cases, we've taken the gifts of technology and we've ruined, like the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone. Greatest thing ever for the sales profession. And by the 1930s, we had ruined it. We needed do not call registries. Alexander Graham Bell would be rolling over in his grave if he knew there was 221 million phone numbers on it by the end of 2021, because we ruined it, right? We did it with email. We did it with video or we're starting to do it with video. We're starting to do it with AI already. We're going to do that. Uh, we did it with LinkedIn just over and over and over again. But the thing that you just talked about is something that was fundamental and core to the sales profession right out of the get-go. I've got pictures in these books and magazines of people laying out math and going, all right, because sales had to be done face-to-face. -face. They had to go travel to these places. And if they weren't really smart and efficient, get the most valuable asset all of you have to convert to revenue is your time. And if you are wasting any of it, then that's, that never, you never get that back. How do we get the best ROI on our time? Celebrate the losses. And how do we get the most efficient use of our time? Take that data and make really smart decisions around where we're spending our time. That combination is deadly. And that's why I love what you guys are. Doing. So there's going to be winners and losers. What are the stakes for leaders who don't pivot off of the traditional mindset? What does that look like? Is it apocalyptic? Is it just walk us through the, your crystal ball of folks not evolving? Yeah. I mean, when we talk about the world of sales has changed so much and buyers no more nowadays, right? Those four words, buyers no more nowadays. Thomas Herbert Russell's book, Salesmanship from 1912, buyers no more nowadays, right? 1912. They were worried about the proliferation of information causing the sales profession to become irrelevant. They, there's a catalog down here from 1908. It's a Sears Roebuck catalog that I have, where it's basically like Amazon, but in paper form, right? The things that we think have changed in the world of sales actually have. The sales profession flourished in 2015 to 2020, when back in 2015, Forrester had proclaimed that 1 million B2B sales jobs would go away by 2020 and that hundreds of thousands of college students wouldn't graduate in the profession because buyers knew more now than it. And that e-commerce was going to eat the sales profession. The opposite happened. So my piece of advice based on your question there is, listen, more information available to buyers has not made it easier on them. It's actually made it harder. And that the people in the sales organization that see that and see that, hey, my role is not to convince you. My role is to help you predict. And I help you predict by displaying the pros and the cons. I go do the homework for you. Go start reading them. Go to chat GPT and ask it, hey, what do we do so that a customer, a potential customer, they're going to be able to do that. Chat GPT is becoming as easy as Google. But then ask it, hey, what circumstances is my company not a good choice? Under what circumstances is it good? Under... If I'm evaluating my company, who else should I be looking at? Like that homework is all there for the buyers. You don't know it's there. That's mistake number one. You're still not going to jam through. All right. So we need to come from that lens that our job 
the true sales profession is meant to be a service profession. You're providing a service to people. So back to your answer about what's the, the problem or what's the issue that's going to come from not doing it. I was talking, I was doing a keynote for a sales organization. We were doing it virtually. In the Zoom window, I was telling the story about, hey, if we're not a good fit, we got to qualify out fast, right? But listen, what you're looking for is not in our wheelhouse. Somebody in the comments had written, oh, and I looked at it and I was like, whoever wrote, no, can we, like, can we take a second here? Tell me about why you wrote. And she was like, tough. I mean, the economy's tough. We got to be able to take, it. we got an inbound lead. We got to pursue it. That revenue, every dollar is important. Here's what I mean. In this environment, this proliferation of the sharing economy, the feedback economy, yeah, you might get that one deal, but it's going to cost you four deals that you never knew existed because they're not coming to you. They're talking to their friends. They're reading reviews. And when I asked her, hey, when we close that deal and they discover that what they needed, you're not best at, what do you do? And she replied, well, we managed through the dissatisfaction. Ooh. All right, good luck with that. That individual, that company is going to tell their friends in the dark circles of social media and their friends and peers and in communities, that the long term is that we're going to lose those deals. You got to play the long game. But in this economy, in this world, the long game wins the short game too. That's how I've tried to build my businesses is that I don't want to be having reps cold calling all day long. Wouldn't it be better if the re our phones are lighting up because our customers are having such a good experience? that they're telling their friends, they're recommending us. When they go to their next company, we're their first call. But we've got to start thinking that way because again, bad news travels fast. There's some phenomenal insight there. So it is, if, I am a, if I'm a sales leader and I hear about some of this long game activity, how do I think about other departments inside the organization and how I can help them and, and how they can help us? Because as, as I'm thinking about the long game, you, know, you need to read the review. You need to understand what your customers know about you offline before they come to you, right? So now you're well-informed on that and you're a value add, if I captured that correctly. So to strengthen my value, my team's value adds, I'm going to put you on the hot seat a little bit here because this is, a, I don't think, a question that you and I prep for, but... How do you build that as a sales team? Because the sales team, they do rely on every other department, right? We need operations and product to build. We need marketing and marketing finance to make sure that commission checks are getting cut on time and things like that. Talk to me a little bit about how you have run that effectively and empowered your sales team to not just do the feature function, show up and, and you know what? Yeah, well, I'll tell you. So, I mean, the most valuable goal that you've got to get those answers is your current customer. My client success team, when we would renew a deal, and some of them felt like this was weird until they started getting the answer. I had my client success team asking renewed customers two questions. All right. Question number one was, hey, I think I know why you renewed. We're awesome, right? But with all the pressures, budgetary pressures, other options out there, why did you renew with us? And then shut up and write down their ink. That's number one. Number that is what I call the tennis ball analogy. And what I mean by this is, I don't know if like in junior high, middle school, you had in class, your teacher brings in tennis balls, you sit at little tables, they put the tennis balls on the tables and they're like, come up with as many uses for this as you possibly can. So you can make a stress reliever. You can hang it from your garage, make sure you don't pull the car in too far. You could put it on the bottom of a walker. Like we come up with 20 different things, none of which included playing tennis. Now, so question number two, we would always ask is, hey, when you went into this relationship with us, you had a set of expectations. What was what's one expectation or one result or one outcome that you realized from working with us that you were not expecting? And then shut up again. I was working with a company that sells financial consolidation tools to accounting department, right? When the company would close their books at the end of the quarter, they would use their technology to help speed up the consolidation of those books so they could report to the fight, you know, the, the investors and the investment community as quickly as possible. They asked that question. The, one of the first times they asked it was to a financial leader of a larger organization. They're like, hey, what's one unexpected outcome you've gotten from working with us? This guy's answer was, you gave me my family. What do you mean? 
And he's like, well, when a quarter would, and I'm in the office for six straight days, weekends, morning till night. I got young kids. I'm missing soccer games. I'm missing weekend. I'm stressed out. You gave me my weekends back. My relationships, with my family went up. You gave me that back. Now that's the type of stuff that you can use to inform and have better conversations with your customers. Those unexpected outcomes are going to give you insight into the true value of why people buy. Remember, this is a quote from Antonio Damasio, but what he says is we as human beings, we are not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think, right? We make emotional decisions. We justify it with the logic. Then why are you selling with logic? We've got to start injecting stories and emotion that make the customers the hero, not us. And you're going to find that your relationship with your customers go up. And so ask those two questions. Why did you renew? What's one unexpected outcome you've gotten from working with us? Those answers are going to help feed a lot of your messaging going forward. That's fantastic. Um, look, I think we've come to the end of one of the better podcasts that I've ever been a part of. So I can't, I can't thank Todd Capone enough. And I will tell you, the reason, Todd, I know you're really good at this, at, at this job and you know what you're talking about is because we prepped for probably about half of those questions. Anybody who does these things know you prep, make sure you're on the same page, make good use of one another's time and, and for the audience out there. But Todd, you just have such a phenomenal sales brain that I couldn't help myself. And I'm, and I'm throwing you, I wouldn't say left field questions, but they're certainly coming out of shortstop at hundred miles an hour and you serve them up. So I'm incredibly impressed with all that you've achieved. And again, Thank you so much. Hopefully for the audience out there, you've taken a lot away. And if you haven't already, you got to pick up Todd's two books, The Transparent Sale and The Transparent Sales Leader. If you are a sales leader, you ought to reach out to, to Todd. I believe it's toddcapone.com, if I've got that right, Todd. Exactly. Uh, yep, that. And so and reach out to Todd. Todd's been an incredibly approachable guy. He's helped me uh, quite a bit along the way, but Todd is a potential amazing resource for you and your team if you want to continue the growth and development of your organization. So Todd, again, thanks so much for the time. Yeah, thank you. And remember, my nerdery knows no bounds. So if anybody's interested, I do have a podcast called the Sales History Podcast. You get it anywhere you listen. You want to nerd out, I just do a monologue 12 to 20 minutes on a different topic every couple of weeks. So that's there. I don't monetize that at all. If you've enjoyed any of that part, have some fun, but yeah, toddcapone.com or follow along on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks. Todd. Thanks, Todd. All right. Thank you. That's it for this week. Don't forget to subscribe to the Field Sales Leadership Guide podcast and visit us at mapmycustomers.com slash podcast for more episodes and resources to help you lead your sales team to success. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.